even with the simplest and most basic of laws of physics, we can think about a nearly infinite variety of possibilities. Mm -hmm. This is the circumstance we see ourselves in particle physics and in cosmology and in string theory, you know, things like that today, where the possibilities are nearly endless. And our goal is to figure out the one or the ones that accurately reflect our own universe. And it just so happens that because there are so many other varieties, our creativity, our imagination is unlimited as well. So the things that we create that go into the movies, that go into stories, that go into comic books, we can use the basis of the possibilities that are laid out by the laws of physics to think of things that are beyond the laws of physics and even give them a little veneer of authenticity, which always makes a story a little bit more fun if you can say it might be true. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great time. It's a great time to be a sci-fi writer. But sometimes we go a little, sometimes the, um, the, uh, the imagination has run a little bit too far. And, and in terms of the Higgs boson, which has the unfortunate and inflammatory nickname of the God particle, which I now understand why, because it's, as you pass through the Higgs, you come into existence. So I understand the nickname mm -hmm. now, but but it is still an unfortunate nickname, and some of the hype surrounding the first use of the Large Hadron Collider included the fear that the discovery of the Higgs would lead to a spontaneous black hole opening up and consuming <laughs> CERN, Switzerland, and then the whole universe, which did not happen. No, it didn't. <laughs> but now, given the increasing weirdness of the world, some are suggesting that the LHC knocked us into an alternate universe that is strange to us which is a way better story than confronting the unsettling <laughs> effects of worldwide income inequality and climate change. So Charles, as a scientist and a communicator, do you have any thoughts or tips on sorting out real cause and effect relationships from just a well-told story? <laughs> um, well, you know, isn't that at the core of all science education, right? We have to convince people to use their tools of cognition and intuition in a way that leads them toward reality and truth and what to do about it, as opposed to some fantasy or alternative environment that we'd like to be in, right? It is hard. Uh, it's worth the effort, but it can be very challenging. It's very comforting to just sort of sit in the reality that somebody else has told you, like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But how does it affect your daily life? Right. So one of the tips that I would say is uh, look at as many sources as you can. And what will happen, for example, let's say there's one interesting scientific result or some result that's announced in the universe. You're like, oh, I'm going to go and find 10 different people mm -hmm. who have written about it, whether it's, you know, this media outlet or that blog or actually read the paper itself. So the person who made the discovery is telling the story and compare all of those things. Come up with the thing that seems to be a likeliness, right? Something that's actually real and believable uh, based on the knowledge that you have. That's sort of the first thing that I would do and, and actually evaluate, right? So, so one of the things that's really important is that you find as many sources as possible to look at. Uh, don't just listen to one authority. You know, if I say something cool and in the next half hour, you think back to this episode. If half an hour from now, you think back to the show and you think, you know, that sounded weird to me. Maybe it was wrong. Um, go and find out. Look up 10 different sources. It could be from the news. It can be from reading the paper itself. It could be reading a book and see if all those things made sense or if indeed I made a mistake, which is very possible, right? Um, another thing that's very important for us to, to keep in mind as we're trying to separate real from unreal is to recognize that we are fallible, that we have the humility to be wrong uh, and say, I thought this was the case, but now I see new evidence, whether it's from my laboratory or from other people telling me stuff or, or you know, my own observations, and I realize that I was wrong. In science, uh, we give credit to people who are wrong too. Uh, Edwin Hubble, for example, who discovered the expansion rate of the universe, he got the rate way wrong, but we still call it the Hubble law, 
or the Hubble, the Maitre law, because he got the concept right. But we all said, yeah, you, you didn't get the number right, uh, but you got the concept right because you tried to find it using the right way. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I would say to people, if you're trying to distinguish between real and not real, is to learn about what we know already. If you have enough background to sort of get the basics of uh, what we're quite certain is a common truth, then when you're getting unusual things, you can then realize that it is an unusual claim. And as Carl Sagan said, and, and Bill Nye also, uh, on his TV show, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. If you recognize that a claim is extraordinary based on what you have, then you can start thinking about it in the context that allows us all to recognize uh, whether or not it is 100% true or somewhat true, has a kernel of truth, or is just made up because it's a good story.